celebrate the Lord and His goodness. It's a blessing to have this great time of celebration as we rejoice over 100 years of ministry through Trinity Wesleyan Church. As we begin today, let's start with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for the privilege of gathering in your house to be able to worship, to celebrate your goodness. Thank you for all the individuals who have poured into the ministry of this church over the years. Thank you for the love and the grace and the sacrifice that has been given. I pray that today you would honor us with your presence. Lord, I pray that you would fill this place. And each of us, although we rejoice over a hundred years of ministry, we, we rejoice even more that we serve a risen King, one who is here with us today and who has promised that he would never leave us nor forsake us. May you be honored today as we worship you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. We're going to take a moment. Uh, it is a privilege. It's always a privilege when you have special guests that are with you for an event. And today is one of those days, and I'm not going to introduce every one of our special guests, but there are a few that I just feel like we need to recognize this morning. Uh, first of all, uh, it's not often you have royalty that comes to your homecoming service. Uh, today we have the homecoming king and queen from Southern Wesleyan University, <laughs> Noah and Caitlin. They won homecoming court yesterday, so we're very excited for them. We also have with us our district superintendent, Pastor Buddy Rampey, and I'm going to ask if he would come and give a greeting to you guys at this time. Good morning. It's great to be here this morning. I didn't get quite the applause that the royalty did, but I understand. I get that. Um, it is truly a blessing and honor to be here this morning and to represent the South Carolina District of the Wesleyan Church. And on this occasion, to extend our congratulations to you, the Trinity Wesleyan Church, for 100 years of ministry in this community and in this state and literally to the world. You know, the story of this church is very similar to so many in our district, kind of emerging and the growth of the textile industry. And in fact, the land, the original spot was given by the Issaquina Mills. I can tell you that happened very often back in those days. Also, don't need to remind you that a lot has changed since that time. And while a lot has changed, our methods do not change. The gospel of Jesus Christ does not change. And I would also remind us today that that message is unique. You know, there's a lot of wonderful, 
organizations serving in the world today. Red Cross, Habitat for Humanity, Cancer Society. But my friends, the local church is still the hope of the world. Amen? Amen. And God has given to us a message that is unique from all the other organizations in the world. We are to tell people how to get to heaven. My grandfather told me that. My grandfather Presley, when he knew I was entering the ministry, he said, well, son, tell people how to get to heaven. <laughs> I guess that kind of boils it down to the basics. You know, across the years, the people and pastors of this church have been a vital part of the story of the South Carolina district. And we are grateful for the lives that have been transformed and have gone out from this place to serve. I don't believe that I've shared with you a personal story that I've of my life and how it intersects with this church at a very critical time in my life. As a brand new teenager, I'll let you guess how old I was, I attended the Sunday afternoon funeral service of Alan Mitchell, the son of Dr. and Mrs. Virgin Mitchell, beloved leaders in our district and our denomination. Their son Alan was killed in an auto accident in Indiana while he was a college student at what was then Marion College preparing for the ministry. I stood outside the back windows, the open back windows of that old church building. The windows were open because it was an overflow crowd. And I was there. One of the speakers, I could not tell you whom, said, Alan was preparing for the ministry. Perhaps there is even someone now who is listening to me and God is calling you to take his place. Now, he didn't ask for a raise hand, but I could have raised my hand. And that was a turning point in my life, and it goes right back to the history of this church. You know, I'm sure that story could be repeated in many forms and many ways of all the hundred years since then, the lives that have been touched and transformed because this church has been here. Um, I loved cars when I was growing up in the 50s, a great time to grow up loving cars. They were so unique, weren't they, back then, and still classics, right? I mean, classic cars. But you know, one thing or three things I'm going to tell you about cars that has not changed, although there's not a lot that hasn't changed about cars, but three things that have not changed since then. First of all, standard equipment then and now was a rear view mirror. Rear view mirrors are important, and I really found that out when I was in Germany driving on the Autobahn, and I, you get over in the left lane, you get out of the way because they'll run over you. you. You have to have that rear view mirror, and that's what we're doing here today, Pastor Mike. This is a rear view mirror for us as a congregation to look back and see where we have been and give thanks to God for his goodness and his favor. But cars also then and now come with side windows. Now they've gotten a lot more fancy since then. But the side members are the reality check. It lets us know what's around us, how we're doing right now at this moment. And then, of course, there's the windshield. And that helps us to see where we're going. I believe that the best days of this church are ahead. If on this day we will take inventory and look back and see how God has blessed and how God has led, how God has used pastors and people to help this church make an impact in this community. I believe the best days are ahead if we will always take that reality check and not just pat ourselves on the, on the back and say, wow, aren't we doing well? But no, no, to really take a look and ask the serious questions, how are we doing? How are we really doing? And then if we will keep that vision ever present as we look toward the future, knowing that God has called us to share with people the good news of the gospel and to tell them how to get to heaven. Again, congratulations, and it's our prayer that God will give you another hundred years of the Lord's Shatari to have impactful ministry in this church and in this state and around the world. God bless you. Thank you, Pastor Buddy. Uh, as many of you know, we'll be holding a special offering as a part of our service today. And I told Pastor Buddy for every minute he spoke, he had to give $1,000. We just raised $5,000. That's wonderful. <laughs> It is a blessing to be, I was joking about that, by the way. Yeah. 
Uh, it is a blessing to be able to worship, but as a part of our worship, sometimes we get to do some different things that uh, we don't always get to do. I'm going to ask, uh, actually one of them is already down here, um, is Corey, is he, there he is in the back. I'm going to ask Corey and Lauren if they would come. We're going to participate in a baby dedication at this time, so obviously bring Cameron Grace with you. It is always a blessing for the church to be able to celebrate when children are brought to us. Children are a blessing that God has given to the body of Christ for, uh, for many years, and it's been a blessing for us to be able to celebrate this. Uh, as we do so, uh, the, the introduction of children into the worship time is actually a great time for us to reflect on who we are. You see, each of us as children of God have a great responsibility to the next generation uh, to point people back to Jesus. Actually, as Jesus was ministering, uh, there were children that were coming to him. And as, he, as the children were coming, the disciples began to almost push them away to sort of give them this idea that, hey, he's got more important things to do. And Jesus stopped them very quickly because he knew that there was nothing more important to do than what he could with those children. Uh, we are told statistically that individuals are more likely to receive Christ before the age of 12 than at any other point in their lifetime. In fact, some statistics indicate that if an individual does not receive Christ by the time they are 12, there is a 90% chance that they will not receive Christ. Uh, that is a significant number of people. Uh, there has never been a more important time for this young lady to be a part of the body of Christ. As a part of that, I've talked already with Corey and Lauren, and they know the expectation that is upon them. Uh, this child is a blessing that has been given to them, but they have a great responsibility. As a mother and a father, this young lady is going to look to them for a godly example. You're going to show her what it is to be a woman of God. You're going to show her what she should be looking for later on for a man of God. But this young lady will do things that look like you. There are going to be times that she'll speak and you're going to think, boy, that sounds just like something that Lauren would have said or something that Corey would have said. And what happens so often is we underestimate the influence that we have with our children. As parents, you can never underestimate the impact of your actions and the choices that you make. It is incredibly important that you guys constantly live in such a way that if she were to imitate your life, you could be proud of who she is. What does that look like? A part of that is allowing your Christian faith to be more than something that you do on Sunday mornings. It's, it involves you being a child of God when you're at home, when you're at work, the, the conversations that you have. You say, well, I, I won't do those bad things in front of my kids. And my response is, kids aren't stupid. Eventually, they will figure it out and they'll begin to do the same things that you've done. And it is so important that you make sure that you both live in such a way that if she imitates you, you will not be ashamed. Several years ago, I was teaching specifically on this issue of making sure you set a godly example in front of kids. And I actually, um, uh, I just mentioned this to one of the guys afterwards that there are times that my children, as a pastor who has kids in this church, uh, there are times that my kids are watching you to see how they should behave. So when you begin to act, you should actually think about how you would react if my kids then imitated what you did. Uh, that very same week, we had a softball game for the church, and the guy who I had been talking with was this really big guy. He's probably six foot six. He, he's, I would consider him a monster compared to me. Uh, he had tattoos all down his legs, and uh, he's playing first base. I'm playing second base at the time, and I hear the, the base coach beside him tell him, how can you call yourself a Christian with that tattoo on your leg? And I watched him, and this guy, he's got a short temper already. What the guy, other guy didn't know was this guy's best friend had attempted suicide earlier that day. But I watched him as he threw his glove down to the ground, and he turned to go toward him, and I thought, dang it, I'm going to have to fight <laughs> at a church softball game. And, and as he made the turn, he saw my son, and he realized that he was watching him. I want to challenge you today. I've already challenged this family, and they know the expectation that is upon them. 
They know that they must live as godly examples because Cameron Grace will be watching their every move. But that same challenge ought to be extended to every person in this room. She is going to watch you. You say, well, I don't want to be a role model. I'm not her mom. I'm not her dad. I don't want to be the one she looks at. Too bad. It's not really up to you who she watches. She's going to make that choice. What is up to you is you must make sure that if she chooses to watch you, that you have lived as an example that you would not be ashamed that she looked and acted like you. Corey and Lauren, is it your desire today to dedicate this child back to the Lord? And if that is your desire, please say that is our desire. Can I take her for a minute? I promise to give her back, especially if she starts crying. Hey, you guys, you see this? Is she not beautiful? Wouldn't it be a shame if she looked at you? And she did not see a child of God, and one day she walked in the same way. Will you as a church, will you as a body of Christ, choose today to be the example that God called you to be? So that if she watches you, and if she imitates you, you will not be ashamed. If that is your desire, say that is our desire. desire. Let's pray. Father, we come before you today and we are so grateful for this beautiful young lady that you have blessed this family with today. Lord, I pray that as you have blessed this family, that you would already begin to place your hand upon her. I pray that you would allow her to constantly see what it is to be a child of God as she looks at the people in her life. Specifically, I pray for Corey and I pray for Lauren and ask that you would allow them the grace that they need to be the the mom and dad that they're supposed to be. Lord, I pray that your hand would be upon Cameron Grace right now, and I ask that you would just guide her every step. Help her to grow to be a beautiful woman of God who would serve you mightily, who would make a difference and would be an instrument of yours to change this world. Lord, right now, we pray that you would help us as a body of Christ to be the support and the encouragement that this family needs, and we will give you praise for what you do. Now we dedicate Cameron Grace Clardy to the Lord in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you. You can have that. Thank you. Would y'all celebrate that? Now, I will also tell you, we did turn the air on in here, even though I don't really feel like it right now. So uh, I, I meant to mention to you before that if you have a camera or a cellular phone or whatever, mobile phone, whatever it is, um, you are encouraged today to take pictures. This is a once in a lifetime event for a church to have a hundred year celebration. And uh, there are no There was a time that individuals, you wanted to have a professional photographer because you wanted to have the high quality picture, but you guys can take the better pictures on your cameras and your phones than probably any of the rest of us could. So please do that and then post on social media afterwards and it would be a blessing. I do want to take a moment and also recognize uh, some of our uh, former ministers. This church has been blessed in so many ways over the years. Uh, We have seen some great things happen. We've seen many people come to Christ. We've seen many families brought together. We've had many babies dedicated or baptized. We've unfortunately also had many funerals. And there have been times that we have seen some great things. There have been times we've seen some very difficult things. But there have always been leaders who have stepped up to help make that happen. And today I would like to take a moment. Uh, can I have anyone who was a, a pastor at this church, whether you were a staff pastor or if you were the, the senior pastor or their families, would you please stand just for a moment? Actually, can we do it this way? Can I have the pastors and the pastor's wives come forward? And can I have y'all up here at the front for a minute, if possible? Just for a moment.
Now there are, there you go. I see Mrs. James is, where's Miss Betty Ryan? These individuals have sacrificed over the years, and I believe that it is appropriate that we as a, as a church family should take this time to simply say thank you, to recognize the sacrifice that they have given, the many years that were put into ministry. These individuals, whether it be the pastor or the spouse, uh, spent many, many hours dealing with things that maybe most of us would know nothing about and be content with that. But without them, this church would not be where it is today. As you guys look around the congregation, you probably see familiar faces. You probably see unfamiliar faces. Maybe some of these folks have come to Christ under your ministry. Some of them have come through other uh, ministry opportunities. What I would say is this. Every time someone finds Christ today, part of it is because of the work that you did. Every time a marriage is restored, a part of it is because of the work that you did. Every time a child is dedicated, a part of it is because of the work that you did. We cannot say thank you enough for the sacrifice that you guys have made. Today, would you express your appreciation to these individuals? I would like to take a moment and just pray over them just for a moment, if you guys are okay. You can be seated. Father, I thank you for these individuals. I thank you for the years of service that were put in. Thank you for the love that they had for these people and they continue to have. I pray that your hand would continue to be upon them. I pray that you would continue to produce fruit through their, through their lives. I pray that they would constantly be aware that their life has made a difference and it will continue to do so. Well, we thank you today for your grace and times that maybe they didn't measure up to their own standards and they became frustrated with things not happening. Thank you that your grace is sufficient for us. Lord, I pray that you would continue to simply uh, produce fruit for what they did already and continue to use them as they continue to serve you. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Thank you very much for your service uh, in the kingdom. All right, at this time, uh, we're going to take just a very brief moment, and I want you to shake someone's hand if you haven't shaken their hand already this morning. Very, very brief. Four. Four. Hey, man, I'm really glad you're here. You do such a great job. Just the organization that I see already. that light. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to be We want you to remain standing. Continue worshiping with us this morning. We want to praise Him.
Thinking back over the past 100 years of this church, of this ministry, it's seen its times of highs. It's seen its times of lows. Uh, I first started tending when it was Second Wesleyan about 40 years ago. And uh, it was a little tiny thing. And uh, there was about, I think, a total of maybe three men that were involved. And... Um, you know, it just kind of thinking over these things kind of made me think about this verse from Lamentation, these series of verses, chapter 3. Yet this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. For his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. And that is something we can all say about the Lord, is that he has been faithful to his church.
Scripture comes from Daniel chapter 3. It says, Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold, the height of which was 60 cubits and its width 6 cubits, and he set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Then Nebuchadnezzar sent the king sent the word to assemble the satraps, the prefects, and the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, and the judges, the magistrates, and all the rulers of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Then the satraps, the prefects, and the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, and the magistrates, and all the rulers of the provinces were assembled for the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. And they stood before that image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Then the herald loudly proclaimed, To you the command is given, O peoples, nations, and men of every language, that at the moment that you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the lyre, the trigon, the psaltery, the bagpipes, and all kinds of music, you are to fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king has set up. But whoever does not fall down and worship shall be immediately cast into the midst of a furnace of blazing fire. 
Therefore, at that time, when all the peoples heard the sound of the horn, the flute, the lyre, the trigon, the psaltery, the bagpipe, and all kinds of music, all the peoples, nations, and men of every language fell down and worshipped the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. For this reason, at that time, certain Chaldeans came forward and brought charges against the Jews. They responded and said to Nebuchadnezzar the king, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree that every man who hears the sound of the horn, the flute, the lyre, the trigon, the psaltery, and the bagpipe, and all kinds of music is to fall down and worship the golden image. But whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into the midst of a furnace of blazing fire. There are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the administration of the province of Babylon, namely Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have disregarded you. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image which you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in rage and anger, gave orders to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Then these men were brought before the king. Nebuchadnezzar responded and said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I have set up? Now, if you're ready, at the sound of the horn, flute, lyre, trigon, psaltery, and bagpipe, and all kinds of music, to fall down and worship that image that I have made very well. But if you do not worship, you will immediately be cast into the midst of a furnace of blazing fire. And what God is there who can deliver you out of my hands? This morning, we pray to the God who can deliver. We pray to the God that for 100 years has used this church to build and bless his kingdom. As we prepare for prayer, would you stand with me? Father, we praise you for your blessings. Father, we praise you for the might and power that you have shown over the years. We praise you for your faithfulness. Father, we celebrate today 100 years of ministry in this church. We know that that is just a continuation of the ministry that you began long ago. We praise you most of all for your son, Jesus Christ, that made all of this possible and worthwhile. Thank you, God, for your faithfulness to this church. May we uh, be faithful to this church and to your calling as this ministry continues. Father, we pray for those who are sick. We pray for those who are hurting, for those who are weak and those who are poor. We pray that you would be a faithful God to them and move mightily in their lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I've recently been given the opportunity to start doing ride-alongs with the Clemson Police Department. And uh, last weekend, uh, it was a dead weekend, there was nothing happening. We were, all the students from Clemson were on fall break, so we just had the opportunity to just stand around and meet people. And to tell you the truth, it has been a blessing to be able to meet folks and to be able to talk with them. But I also must confess that there have been times that it has caused me to be more aware of some of the brokenness that is present. I will tell you that particular night, there were multiple occasions where we ended up in conversations. Remember, by the way, that the college students were not there. They were on fall break. So don't automatically assume, well, it's because it's Clemson and there's so much perversion there on campus. The college students weren't there. But it seemed as if every conversation centered around some type of sexual perversion, centered around language that was incredibly inappropriate. Uh, the officer that I was riding with would occasionally, when the conversations began to become a little more graphic, he would say, hey, I don't know if I told you, but this guy riding with me is our police chaplain. <laughs> Amazingly enough, most of them did not change the conversation based on the fact that I was a pastor or a chaplain. It is the world in which we live today. What I would suggest to you today is the world has never needed the church to rise up more than what it needs it today. There is so much brokenness all around us, and I'm going to tell you that the only hope is Jesus Christ. Amen. There is nothing else that can redeem this community or the world outside of here. But the church has been here for 100 years, and it will continue to move forward, and we will continue to impact this community for him. Amen. As we do that, I share that information because I am so grateful that as we get to give to this congregation, what we are genuinely doing is giving back to God so that we can be a part of transforming this community. 
We're going to partake in our morning tithes and offering. I do want to just mention today, uh, I mentioned that we were going to have a special offering. Um, we really did turn the air on. We didn't turn it off so we could take a special offering to fix the air conditioning. Um, although I did think about that ahead of time. <laughs> Uh, however, uh, we are in need of replacing our air conditioning system as well as trying to do some improvements to the youth room. I mentioned earlier, so much of uh, the body of Christ is built when they are in children's ministry and youth ministry ages. And it's such a priority for us. We believe in this particular church that our youth and children ought to be one of the most important aspects of ministry. So uh, we are looking to invest in those things and actually even to replace the sound system here in the church. We really want to be able to do that. Uh, so if you would like to give toward that today, we welcome that. Uh, I would suggest that if you're going to give a special offering that you would note it on the bulletin uh, or the envelopes that are in your pews, that would be appreciated. Uh, another piece of information for you is we have begun using what's called square giving, uh, which is a way for people, if you want to use your credit or debit card, you can do that out in the foyer afterwards or over in the Family Life Center. So uh, you'll need to find Richard. Richard, wave for, for me. Uh, he will be out there. He'll have a podium that he'll be standing at, and he has the, uh, the system that will be there with him. It is a safe and secure way to give. I know a lot of people don't carry cash anymore. People don't carry their checkbooks, and this gives us the opportunity to still be able to participate. Let's pray for the offering this morning. Father, thank you again for all that you've done. Thank you for the open doors that we have as a church in this community. We know the brokenness that is there. We see it. We experience it. And we know that the only place where we will find healing and restoration is in you. Lord, I pray today for this church that you would empower us to go out and to transform this community for you. I pray for each individual now as we give. Help us to give joyfully knowing that we are investing in your kingdom. I pray that you would help us to give knowing that as we do so, we are enabling people to come and to find you. Lord, may you be honored and help us as a church to be good stewards, to use these resources to bring honor and glory to your name. We ask all these things in Jesus' name, amen. By the way, our goal this uh, year for the special offering is $30,000. Sounds like a lot, but Pastor Buddy's already given five, so we're good. So <laughs> thank you. a journey we walk by faith and there'll always be the mountain in our way but right here in this moment may our strength be renewed as we recall what God has done and how we've seen him move if there's anybody here found him faithful anybody here who knows he's able oh say amen if there's anybody here who has seen his power anybody here brought through the fire come on say amen anybody here found joy in the midst of sorrow in the storm, hope for tomorrow, I've seen it time and time again, just say amen, amen. Sometimes through the darkness, it's hard to see. Just be brave and follow where he leads. Greater is the one who's in us than he who is in the world. So child of God, remember the battle is the Lord's. Anybody here who knows he is able.
faithful and of course we rejoice over that today. It is our privilege today to have a guest speaker with us and we could have had just about anyone come and share. There have been some great pastors. We could have called any of those individuals. Uh, We've had actually we've got a great team of ministers that are here today. Uh, I will tell you that uh, all of the things that have taken place today I feel like I've been a little bit of a slacker because other people have stepped up to the plate and they've made things happen. I'm very very grateful uh, grateful for all of those who have uh, helped to serve today. So there are plenty of people we could have had come up. Uh, we have an individual who is with us today. He is the district superintendent in the Florida District of the Wesleyan Church. Uh, but he was a part of this church first. And it is a privilege to have Patrick and Sherry with us. Patrick, would you come and share with us this one? Would you make him feel welcome? I need a second just to be able to look around. I've seen so many faces and tried to figure out who some of you are. I could tell you this, some of us have matured a little over the last 20 some years, but it's neat to see that I can still see you at that same age because I've seen a lot of your kids here leading and serving. And it's awesome uh, to, be able to, to be able to see that. Well, it's an honor and privilege to be here in this special homecoming service that you're celebrating 100 years. It is, I uh, also just want to say thanks to Pastor Mike um, for the invitation. I tend to uh, sometimes hold back, um, but uh, in this time I... I knew that uh, I felt God wanted us here for some reason. My wife, Sherry, has mentioned uh, she's on the front, and it's good to see some of her best friends sitting with her. How does it feel to be up front? Yeah. (laughs) Usually, Troy and Debbie are way back there. Well, Sherry's uh, really excited to be here as well. We're so humbled to be able to share this morning with you. Uh, We want you to know, church, we love you and we thank you for all your prayers over the years and how you've encouraged us. For those of you who may not have attended back in the 80s or even in the early to mid-90s, our family was here during two different spells and we had our little ones and Uh, They were just starting to grow up here, and the foundation, I guess you would say, for our family was established as a result of this church. I can remember programs that they were in, one that we did multiple times over in the future as we were in ministry, uh, called Dr. Newhart, uh, that they were a part of, and maybe you remember some of those things as well. Uh, It is just so cool 
to be able to be back. And my mind just keeps racing to so many thoughts, so many memories. And you know, today is part about the past. It's about celebrating. It's about remembering. Because if we don't remember our past, we're not going to get to where God wants us to go next. So I remember when Reverend Wiggins uh, shared something in a message just months before he was going to be leaving this church and, and uh, becoming the district superintendent of the Georgia district about how he was disappointed that he hadn't seen more people called to ministry through the time that he was here in his ministry. And that morning, I felt God's call. I remember how the incredible things would take place during the services. Sometimes it wasn't the preaching. It was the, the pastor would just know that the Spirit was here and would move aside and let God do whatever God wanted to do. And the incredible things in and through this church. See, we came from a great church called Trinity. You sent us out. We've tried to do what God's called us to do through the years. You know, back then, and I'm still sure it's true today, there's many missionaries that made up, retired missionaries, made up this church. And this morning in Sunday school class, I heard of new missionaries going out from this church. Kids. Kids. Back in the day, there was many retired pastors, and I can see many are still here today. And some of the young ones have gone out to pastor from this church. Then I was in a Sunday school class that uh, I guess I left in good hands because he's been there for 22 years doing it. And uh, Troy, amazing. God uses you in such an incredible way. You are a pillar, you and Debbie, for this church, this younger generation that's coming along. As we heard in the dedication, the little ones are watching. They have good people to watch really good people to watch, and that is awesome. Well, whether it's missionaries or pastors or great lay leaders, I'll tell you this. This church is a wonderful incubator for people that want to mature in their faith, ones that want to come along, ones that want to go all the way, and even some that are called to full-time ministry. Well, I owe a debt to many of you, and I say thank you today. Thank you for being that, those people that were the encouragement to me as I was called. I'll never forget uh, moments of, of uh, coming down from speaking and being surrounded by folks that just said things that you wouldn't think you would hear, at least not in life, but probably the afterlife type of thing. And I, I remember thinking, why are they saying these things? And it scared me. But it's those people that encourage you, that bring you along, that help you to see maybe what God sees in you, but you don't see in yourself. Now, I'd be really amiss here if I didn't call out just a couple of names, and the first is the one who I consider my pastor still today, uh, Reverend Wiggins, thank you for allowing God to use you in my life. It's such a blessing. You have been a father figure, spiritual father in every way, best model, and uh, Mrs. Wiggins as well. I remember when we were in your home as newlyweds with other newlywed couples and how you encouraged us to, in our faith to walk. I also <clears throat> had a mentor here, uh, Reverend W.D. James. He may no longer be with us, but he is. And don't, don't, us, don't, don't any of us forget his model, his approach, his life. 
and uh, Mrs. James, uh, I knew uh, without you texting me yesterday, I knew you were praying. I knew that she was expecting God to move here today. And uh, church, that's what it's about. God has things in mind. And there's some that maybe have it dialed in a little bit closer, you know. They know how to reach heaven. <clears throat> and those folks do. I know my wife is one of those. And I, I know even when we were back here, young, she knew that <clears throat> there, Reverend Wiggins had that ability. He could just dial up and there it was. And, and <clears throat> see, we walked into this church one morning after he asked me to speak uh, and give I thought what was supposed to be my testimony, and, and I was so nervous, and, and uh, she knew it, and uh, he pulled me aside back there in the little offering room. I don't know if it's the offering room anymore, and, and he said, let's pray. Well, it didn't help at the moment, <clears throat> but when we got up here, and I was out of what to think and uh, what to say anymore to God, and there it was. It was time when I got up. The Holy Spirit was there. See, I'll never forget the incredible things that God has done here because he's done them, yes, among all of us, but he's done them in me. And so thank you for the opportunity to grow among you. Now this morning I'd like to share with you about how to move forward in faith, because there's a past and a present, as Buddy has reminded us, and a future. The past is great. The present looks pretty good. But how do we move forward? You know, everybody at one time or another has been afraid to take the next step with God. And although we've heard many, many times that God loves us and has a wonderful plan for our lives... We still find ourselves dragging our feet in fear instead of marching forward in faith. What are the fears that stop us from moving forward in our faith? I'm going to give you three basic fears that we all have. The first, if you're a note taker, it's in your notes, the fear of failure. The fear of failure causes worry, tension, stress, embarrassment, and even panic. Why is it such a big fear? I think it's because our society places such an emphasis on success. And if you don't match their idea of success, then we're seen as a failure or a nobody. And how others see you and how you stand up to the pressure of that test is a test of your character. See... Don't worry about what others think of you because success and failure is not important through how others view it. It's important through how God views it. And so if you're stepping out with God, you're really a success. So first, we fear, fear failure. Secondly, we fear standing alone. I can tell you, my mother was here this morning, and I tried to introduce her in some way and call her up. She would literally kill me after the service. She does not like to be in front of people. Uh, and she doesn't like to feel alone. She likes to have a lot of people around her. And we all want to have others stand with us in the battles of life. But sometimes God, well, he allows us to stand alone, to set our feet firmly on the ground. And we just need to learn that there will be those times that God expects us to stand without others standing with us. And so secondly, we fear standing alone. The third is the fear of the unknown. We never, want to, we never know what's around the corners of life. We can't see what's going to happen next. And this causes all kinds of anxiety for us. It's kind of like a thousand-piece puzzle. Just think about life 
like a thousand piece puzzle, you got the box top. And so you put it together based upon seeing the picture, right? Here's the problem. In our lives, in the pieces, God doesn't give us the box top. We don't see the big picture of where our life is going. We only have pieces. And it's, it's what brings anxiety to our lives. Where does this next piece go? What do we do? And so we fear that if all things don't fall into place, we fear what might happen to us. And so sometimes we have a fear of the future, which is really the fear of the unknown. Now we have these fears, and we can react in two different ways. The one way is to become a coward. Nobody wants to be a coward, but sometimes we don't realize how easy it is to make the wrong choice. The second is to face our fears with faith. And the Bible says the faith drives out fear. And so I ask you this morning, what are the steps that we need to take to overcome fear? Because I don't think there's a person in this room that would say that I don't want to move forward with God into my future that he has for me. We all want that. What are the steps to overcoming fear so that we can? Well, there are five steps that you can take in overcoming fear of moving forward. And it's found in our scripture reading this, uh, this morning, in our text. And I'm going to key in on those and sort of pick up on where we ended with the scripture reading itself, where the king basically says, what God can rescue you from my hand, right? And don't we ask that question in life? I mean, the world asks it, just like the king, and I think we ask it as well as Christian people. Can God rescue me from the king? Well, here are the steps you can take in overcoming the fear of moving forward with God in faith. First, stop defending and start doing what God has already told you to do. What God has made clear to you in his word, you need to do it. Don't sit around wondering about it or defending what God has said to you. Just do it. We need to act quickly because God expects obedience from his children. If God tells you to do something that seems crazy in the eyes of worldly people, he doesn't say, stop, see which way the wind's blowing, or take a poll like the politicians, which we know don't work anyway. He says, do it. Move forward with him in faith. Daniel chapter 3, there's a story about three guys who faced their fear. Their names, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These guys were faced with King Nebuchadnezzar's decree that said they must bow down to the idol or they would be killed. And I want you to notice how they respond to the king's demand found in Daniel 3, 16. Uh, by the way, I like to relate this to John 3, 16. And you get it if you think of the whole picture of Daniel 3. It's kind of cool how God saves but it says, Daniel, if you have your Bibles, Daniel 3, 16, it says, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this manner. The phrase, we do not need to defend ourselves. Notice, they understood what God wanted them to do. There wasn't a question in their mind. They knew that God had said not to bow down to idols or to other gods, and so it was a big deal to them to stand up and walk in God's way. And the first step to overcoming the fear of moving forward in your faith is stop defending yourself with others and start doing what God has already said. The second step you must take in overcoming the fear of moving forward is believe God is able to save you from your greatest fears. Um... 
I'm always amazed how God does things, but did you notice the last song? That was the highlight of this morning. It ties into everything in this scripture. Are you walking through the fires of life? Have you had God's power? Don't know the words, I'm not repeating them, but have you seen him rescue you, save you, been there for you? It's amazing how God puts those things together. But here we find Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego say to the king in Daniel 3.17, If we're thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to save us from it. Is able. He is able, church. Do you believe that this morning? God is able to save us. <clears throat> well, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego believed that their God was bigger than all their problems. They believed the God of creation, the God who created all things, the God who created mankind was surely able to save them from their situation. And we know that our God in which we serve, he's bigger than all life circumstances. And we know that he has us in his hands. We know that he's the one who gives life and knows when our life is up. And so we should be able to believe without any problem that he's able to save us. And believing God is able to save you from your greatest fear is step number two in moving forward in your faith. But how about step number three? Trust that God will do what's best in your life. I believe this is where the rubber meets the road. I think most of us as Christian people, we understand what God says, and we know we're supposed to get to it. We understand that God is able to save us from our greatest fears. I don't think that's the problem. The rubber meets the road in the fact that we're not sure if we believe that God will do what's best for us, right? We question that sometimes. Or we doubt that. Does God I really understand everything that's going on? And in Daniel 3, 17 to 18, it continues by saying this. If we're thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to save us from it. And he will rescue us from your hand, O king. But even if he does not, we want you to know, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. Did you get it? He will rescue us, but even if he does not. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego placed their lives into God's hands. They didn't know what God would do, but they did believe he would do what is best. And so they stood their ground with the king because they believed God was able to save them and trusted that he would do what was best for them. Let me ask you a question. Who knows better? You, the one who can't see the future. We don't have a box top. And he even fears the future or the unknown. Or God, who knows all things and does what's best. Not even close. And so the third step we must take in overcoming the fear of moving forward with God is to trust God that he will do what's best in our lives. And then the fourth step you must take in overcoming the fear of moving forward is act upon what you say you believe. Listen to how the story develops with these guys in Daniel 3, 19 to 24. It says that Nebuchadnezzar was furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and his attitude toward them changed. He ordered the furnace heated seven times hotter than usual and commanded some of the strongest soldiers in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. And so these men, wearing their robes, trousers, turbans, and other clothes, were bound and thrown into the blazing furnace. The king's command was so urgent and the furnace was so hot that the flames killed the soldiers who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, firmly tied, fell into the burning furnace. It's easy to say, I trust God. 
It's easy to say, I rely on his strength. It's easy to say, God will take care of me. It's a little harder to actually act upon it. We need to do what we say we believe. And I love the phrase where God guides, God always provides. Do you believe that? Well, I believed it when I left this church to enter ministry 22 years ago. And God has proved himself over all those years. He is able and he does do what is best. Many times we just want God to do things for us without us getting involved in the situation. But the fact of the matter is, he looks for us to do our part, to get involved. And we need to be faithful to take care of those things that we can and pray and allow him to do the things that we can't. It is his church, it is his people. He can do what he wants done. Well, we got to do our part and try to trust God for the rest. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you know, they were just where God wanted them to be. You know, church, sometimes we don't get the picture real well. But I think Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were just about like I am here. They had their feet dangling over the edge of a fiery furnace. And they weren't comfortable, I'm sure. But they were just where God wanted them to be. Because in that spot, they could not help themselves. God had to do what only God could do. And that's when God does those things that amaze us. See, the more we trust Him, the more courageous in life we become because we start acting on what we say we believe. It's like the old hymn. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus than to trust and obey. Do you find yourself restless this morning? I ask you the question, are you trusting and are you obeying? Because when a person's at peace, when you're at peace with God, what's happening in life, you're happy. Not like the world, but it's something inside that you know, that you know, that maybe no one else knows that you know. God has you. God has you. And I know that somebody maybe this morning God's talking to. And he's saying, you know, it's time to stop talking. And it's time to start walking. And so fourthly, we must trust and we must act upon what? We say we believe. The final step you must take in overcoming the fear of moving forward is this. Have confidence that you won't be alone in the fires of life. Look at what happens to these guys in Daniel 3, 24 and 25. It says, Then King Nebuchadnezzar leaped to his feet in amazement, asked his advisors, Weren't there three men that we tied up and threw into the fire? They replied, Certainly, O king. He said, Well, look, I see four men walking around in the fire unbound and unharmed, and the fourth looks like the son of the gods. Can you feel the king's shock? You know, a number of years ago, when we found ourselves in the first Iraq war, we as Americans saw something on TV that we had never seen before. War. Right in our living rooms. On the television set. They would show us these precision bombs that they would drop. 
And it looked like to me, I don't know about you, but it looked like it, they, they went right down the chimney of these buildings and then boom, and you know. CNN, back in the day, coined the phrase, I'm not sure who it might have been that said it, but it was shock and all. Now let me tell you, it's a matter of perspective. Here, as I watched, I was in awe of what I was watching. Wow, how could this happen? I mean, it's incredible, the precision of our military and these bombs. But on the other side, I'm sure that they were in shock on how these bombs could be dropped in their neighborhoods. Shock and all. I relate that to our scripture reading this morning. That's exactly where the king finds himself. He's in shock and all of what's happening right before his eyes. I mean, he calls out to his folks and he says, Hey! Is my arithmetic right? Didn't we send three guys into that blazing furnace? And he says, surely, O king. Well, I count four. And then he says, and the fourth looks like the son of the gods. You know, the king found out that he was in the presence of the supernatural that day. He was right in what he was seeing. But it didn't change the fact that he was in shock over what he was seeing and in awe. But it did do something for him. And that's... Uh, a very cool thing. What did it do? It made him change. He changed the way he thought. He changed the, the, the things that he said and how he acted. And that's an interesting thing since he was the king. And I think, folks, this morning we got to understand first, God is a God of miracles. He can rescue us from that fiery furnace, whatever we're facing and struggling with in life. And if we're going through a storm in life, God will be there for us. He will get us through. If we're coming up short in some way, whatever that may be. But I ask you, church, which is the greatest miracle? Think about this. Is it that those guys walked into the furnace and were still alive? Or is it that God walked with them in the furnace and brought them out the other side and they didn't have a singed part on their body. Was it that he saved them or was it that he did something that they had never ever seen before and how he was right there with them through it all? I'm here to tell you I'm not sure if God is going to do the miracle in your life. I'm not sure where he's going to take you. I'm not sure if, if, if your feet are on the edge, if you're going to go across, then it's going to be over. But what I'm absolutely sure of, and what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego was absolutely sure of, is that God would be with them, and that he would do what's best. And so when they got pushed from the edge in 
They were okay. And I'm here to tell you, if you're not on the edge, get on the edge. Because it's when you're on the edge, when you're wondering what God's going to do, the thing is, you have the chance, the opportunity, to take the step off the edge and walk with God. And there is no better place to be than to take that step off and to know, wow, God's there. God's there. And when you experience him in that kind of way, there's no going back. It becomes the stake that you put in the ground that you remember and you say, God showed himself. I felt his presence. I experienced him. He got me through. I'm past that fire. I might be facing another one, but he has shown me how he can get me through before. So no matter what you're going through, you can be courageous because God is with you. And when you know without a shadow of a doubt that God is on your side, your courage grows by the second. Now what will the results be of moving forward with God in faith? I got two of them for you this morning. And the first is God is glorified. Notice it says in verse 26, Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening of the blazing furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come here. Servants of the Most High God. That's kind of cool. He didn't see it that way in the beginning, remember? See, the king paid honor to God. He forgot about his God and focused on the one true God. And when we move forward with God in faith, people see the miracles that God does in and around our lives, and they, too, can begin to worship Almighty God themselves. Remember the decree that the king had made in the beginning that caused this whole problem? Look what he does now. The king says in verse 29, I decree that the people of any nation or language or who say anything against God, the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be cut into pieces and their houses be turned into piles of rubble for no other God can save in this way. Let's do the full circle. Back to verse 15, when the king said, who will be able to save you or rescue you from my hand? Well, the king found his answer. And in getting the answer, it totally changed how he went about things. And he called others to change as well. Why? Because three men were willing to step out, to step beyond what they had already known. They were willing to trust God in the unknown. And so God was glorified. Now, not only is God glorified when you move forward in faith, but also you tend to gain influence with others. Look what it says in verse 30. It says, then king, the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the providence of Babylon. Did you catch it? They got promoted. Okay, church. Imagine this. Tomorrow morning, you go into work. And when you show up, your boss calls you into his office and he says, I got to talk to you. And you sit down all nervous, wondering what's going to happen next. And what he says is, I'm promoting you. And you think to yourself, woo, I'm getting promoted. 
And you know, a lot of things come with getting promoted and all, and you think about all those things, and when it's all said and done, you, and it might not even be all said and done because you guys are really good at this pushing the button stuff, but if you don't do that while he's talking to you, you get out of that office that you're in, and then all of a sudden, on the phone you go, and you're speaking to your spouse, and you're saying, guess what happened? I got promoted today. We're gone out. We're going to pick it. You know, we're going to the nicest restaurant in the area. Now, I don't know what that is today, but I think Pixie and Bill's is still around, so that's one good one. Uh, and, and so there you go. And you celebrate what God has done in your life. You know, that very thing actually happened here. You remember? I was in Greenville working. And uh, I came to Reverend Wiggins and I said, uh, I sure like to be more involved through the week here at the church, do different things. But I have a problem driving from Greenville all the way here and there's a big gap between the times to get here. He says, well, are there any other offices close? For the company I work for, and I said, well, yeah, there's uh, one in Anderson. He goes, well, let's pray that you get transferred there. No, I said, Reverend Wiggins, you don't understand. The guy that was, that's the manager there, he's been there for like 20 years. That can't happen. Now, do you know what, <laughs> do you know what happens when you tell someone like Reverend Wiggins, you know, those prayer warriors, that can't happen? Well, I do. So we had our little, you know, time of prayer, and uh, I headed back uh, uh, home and so forth. I'm telling you, on, that was on a uh, Wednesday night. <laughs> I'm praying, and my boss calls me into his office on Friday morning. And he says, uh, Patrick, he says, uh, I was wondering something. And I said, what's that? He says, uh, would you be willing to move, you know, uh, and so forth, your family, if uh, I had something uh, different for you? I said, it depends. And he says, what's it depend on? Uh, I said, well, if it's now, I'd do it. But if it's somewhere down the road, I said, I'm tired of moving my family around, you know, and I, I'd like to get them settled, you know, in a place, and I feel pretty good about where we're at now. He says, so that's great. He says, uh, all right. I'm making you the new manager over at the Anderson office. And I just looked at him in shock. And you know what I said? This is what I said. Well, what happened to that guy? He's been there for over 20 years. He, and you know, he wasn't a Christian man. You know what he said back? It doesn't matter what happened to him. He says, you're the new manager. And I said, well, when does that start? He goes, show up there on Monday. Wednesday night, folks, Friday morning, that's what I'm talking about. When God's part of whatever is happening, crazy things happen. And the devil tries to get us not to move forward by telling us people will think well, you're a failure or you're crazy. Or, or, and yet God gets us to believe that if we move forward in faith, that he will promote us into a position that will have greater influence than we, we or anyone else would have ever thought that we would have had. And you want to make a real impact with your life? Then I would tell you, stop listening to the lies of Satan that cause you to fear. Fear moving forward. And start listening to the God that has led your life and walking in faith with him watching the supernatural take over. Now, if you got nothing from this morning in terms of this message, I would ask you just to remember this thought. See, overcoming the fear of moving forward with God starts with having faith in God. But in what type of God? In a God who is always Always, always faithful.
to us. Church, you have a great past and a great present. Let's move forward in faith with God. And whatever he asks of us, whatever he challenges of us, take the faith and make that step. Will you? I hope you will. Thank you. Amen. Thank you for sharing with us today. I appreciate your faithfulness to share God's word. I do have a couple of things I'd like to share with you real quick just as we close. Uh, first of all, um, I mentioned that there was a special offering. There were actually inserts in your bulletin. If you wanted to and you did not come prepared to give, there are actually pledge cards. You could use those. And uh, if you would, uh, if you choose to do that, if you would, there's offering plates that are always back there in the foyer. If you drop one in there, that would help us just to know what was pledged. I also wanted to mention we have some books that have been put together for the 100-year celebration. Uh, Billy Fay Harvey worked incredibly hard to help put this together for us. Uh, and they will be distributed out in the foyer and at each of the exits for this building. And anyone who would like to grab one, we welcome that. We would love for you to pick one up. And uh, just gives a little bit of the history, some of the things that have taken place, identifies different pastors who served, uh, and identifies all the folks who really, honestly, this church is not here without these folks. And, and it's just a way to celebrate them and to say thanks. So please be sure you grab one of those. Um, the staff members will be the ones that are going to be distributing those, uh, which this gives me the opportunity just to say thanks to them. Uh, specifically, I'm going to start with Daly. Uh, Daly has worked incredibly hard to put all of the music stuff together for today, and I cannot say thank you enough to her. Uh, Derek Pulley is up in the sound uh, booth, and he and his wife Amy have worked very hard for this as well. Uh, Lee is our youth pastor, does an awesome job. Aaron is the children's pastor, and he is in the other building because we don't trust him in front of everybody else. Um, but uh, if you see him today, if you'd express your appreciation to him as well. And then, of course, Debbie, who is always working hard and such an incredible blessing to me. Uh, I cannot say thanks enough to the staff and, of course, my wife as well, as she uh, works harder than probably I ever do. So I'm very grateful for those folks. I also would like to invite every single individual who is here to join us for lunch. We have a meal that has uh, been prepared over in the Family Life Center, and we would love it if each of you would come. I know many of you have brought food. Some did not, but I want you to know we have enough regardless of whether or not you brought anything today. Uh, we would love to have you come. As a part of that, there is actually a video presentation that uh, Brother Vess has put together for us uh, that will be shown on the screen over there. There are also uh, tons of old stuff. And when I say old stuff, there are uh, photo albums that actually came from Marie Evett uh, many years ago, and they will be made available as well. We have uh, some of the documentation from the, the second Wesleyan church. One of the things that is on display out there is the original uh, minutes from the very first meeting held at the second Wesleyan church. Uh, and all that information is out there, and it would be great if you guys want to uh, just hang out and fellowship all afternoon. We would love to have you guys there for that. Um, I would like to close us in prayer, but as I do, I would also like to pray for the food. I'm going to ask when you go over there, children and youth, please hear this. I would rather have the senior adults at the front of the line. So let them eat. If you would, find one of the senior adults that maybe they can't carry their plates and go offer to help them. That would be a great way to be a blessing to them. Let's pray, and then uh, you guys will be free to go. Father, thank you for the privilege of gathering in your house today. We do celebrate the past. We celebrate 100 years of ministry. We celebrate the fact that you have been reaching people. You have been calling people. You have been doing things that we could not do ourselves. But by the grace of your Holy Spirit, by the fact that you have been here with us and working through us, Lord, we have seen great and mighty things. But we believe today that the best days of this church are not behind us. It is not today. It is every day moving forward. We believe that your Spirit will continue to be poured out upon us. 
We pray that you would fill us and that you would use us. And I do truly pray that this community would be transformed by the presence of your Holy Spirit. Lord, thank you for the sacrifice of these people. Not only the pastors who we recognize, but the many people who have served alongside them over the years. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for continually being with them and guiding them and directing them. But Lord, I pray that, Lord, I pray that tomorrow would be even better. Lord, I pray that you would fill these people, that you would use them in such a mighty way that nobody could mistakenly take credit for it, but we would have to give credit to the King of kings and the Lord of lords who still is delivering people from the fire. Lord, I pray that your anointing would be upon us, each and every one of us. Lord, I pray now that as we partake in fellowship and food, that you would be honored. I pray that you would help us to uh, continually keep you in the center of every conversation. I pray that you bless the food that we eat. Thank you for all the many folks who have prepared food for us today. May you be honored as we celebrate together. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Thank you so much for being a part of our worship service this morning. Come join us for lunch if you can.